The SpaceX Starship program has come a long way. We've seen them achieve some truly incredible feats, like catching a super heavy booster mid-air using the launch tower, and not just once, but multiple times. That alone is a massive engineering achievement. But when it comes to landing the Starship upper stage, SpaceX still hasn't quite nailed it. Even though they came very close at one point, recent attempts seem to be falling short again. So why is landing Starship so difficult? A reusable rocket is already a very hard thing to achieve. Before SpaceX, those two words, reusable and rocket, were rarely seen in the same sentence. But the way SpaceX chose to do it, landing a rocket vertically is an even more difficult challenge. For this, we can use the Falcon 9 first stage as a simpler example. Both the Falcon 9 and Starship's Super Heavy use rocket engines at the bottom, not just for upward thrust, but also for rotation and maneuvering. The Falcon 9 can actually do three different things with its main thruster. First, it can accelerate vertically. This is obviously useful for slowing down the rocket's descent so it doesn't crash. It can also accelerate horizontally, which helps change the rocket's horizontal velocity. That's how it adjusts its position to land precisely on a barge out in the ocean. Then there's angular acceleration, which means changing the rocket's rotation around its center of mass. This becomes important when you want the rocket to stay upright during landing. To move slightly to the right, for example, the rocket needs to tilt a bit in that direction. But since the thrust isn't perfectly aligned with the center of mass, this creates torque, which causes the rocket to rotate. On top of all that, the thrust itself has to be adjusted constantly to manage vertical motion at the same time. So yeah, landing a rocket like this is a seriously hard problem. Now, in theory, you could design a vehicle that lands much more easily. Instead of being tall and skinny like the Falcon 9, it could have a lower center of mass, placing it closer to the engines so that any applied thrust wouldn't create as much torque. It could also have multiple thrusters to balance out torque or cancel it entirely. Add in some side thrusters and you could adjust the rocket's horizontal position without even rotating it. Seems like a better design, right? Well, not quite. Even though this kind of design would make landing easier, the Falcon 9 wasn't built for that. It was built to launch payloads into orbit. That's its main function. And for that job, a tall and narrow rocket is actually better. The slimmer the rocket, the less air resistance it experiences while flying through the atmosphere. Air drag is mostly based on the cross-sectional area of the rocket, so a wider design would slow down more and require way more fuel to compensate. And if you need more fuel, you need a bigger rocket to carry that fuel, which then needs even more fuel to lift itself. It's a spiral of inefficiency. When launching rockets, every bit of mass matters. It's truly impressive that SpaceX has managed to reuse the Falcon 9 booster so reliably. The booster has landed successfully over 400 times, a remarkable achievement in itself. However, when it comes to Starship, the level of difficulty increases significantly. Unlike the Falcon 9, which descends engines first, Starship re-enters the atmosphere belly first to maximize drag. This approach slows the vehicle more efficiently and reduces the heat and stress of re-entry. But it also introduces a major challenge. The engines are pointed sideways during most of the descent. While a Falcon 9 needs to ignite just one engine at the right time to land, Starship must light up to three engines mid-air, gimbal them to flip the entire vehicle vertically, then shut down two and land precisely using the remaining one. It's a far more complex maneuver, especially for an unproven system. The fact that SN10 managed to stick the landing, albeit briefly before exploding, was a milestone in itself. Interestingly, SpaceX's experience landing the Falcon 9 booster is more directly applicable to the Super Heavy booster. That's one reason they've been able to refine the technique so quickly. The system can now reliably land on the sea or be caught by the launch tower, but Falcon 9 doesn't attempt to recover its upper stage, and that's where Starship differs. In fact, no rocket in history has ever tried to land a fully orbital upper stage. SpaceX is attempting something entirely new and has had to figure it out from scratch. The landing profiles of Falcon 9 and Starship are fundamentally different. Starship is designed to re-enter at orbital velocity, which means it needs to bleed off far more speed. Aerodynamic drag plays a bigger role here, hence the belly flop maneuver and the need for a dramatic flip maneuver before landing. 
This also requires the use of header tanks to feed the engines cleanly and avoid fuel sloshing or bubble ingestion during the flip and landing burn. All of these are new challenges, and while SpaceX is getting very close, they're still quite not there yet. One of the major challenges with Starship development is that the dry mass of both stages has consistently increased over time. This steady weight gain is one of the reasons SpaceX committed to catching the booster with the launch tower right from the start, rather than first using landing legs and optimizing later. It's all about saving every possible kilogram of mass. The Block 1 Starship has already launched, reached orbital velocity, re-entered the atmosphere, and completed a water landing intact. That in itself is impressive. But even so, it doesn't yet have enough performance margin to carry a meaningful payload. With payload capacity currently estimated at just 1-4% to of the vehicle's total liftoff mass, it might seem like squeezing out a few extra percentage points should be easy, but it's not. Improving payload capacity means reducing dry mass, improving engine efficiency, ISP, and or increasing propellant load. If you don't do one or more of those things, the rocket might still get off the pad, but it won't reach orbit with a useful payload. Lifting off is the easy part. Reaching orbit with performance to spare is the real challenge. There's a real risk that Starship could technically work as designed, but end up delivering too little payload to make the system practical or cost-effective. Reusability, especially recovering and landing the second stage, comes with significant mass penalties. Every kilogram devoted to heat shielding, landing gear, propellant reserves, or structural reinforcement is one less kilogram available for payload. That's the tightrope SpaceX is walking. Building a fully reusable two-stage-to-orbit system without sacrificing so much performance that it undermines the whole point. There are several ways to increase Starship's payload capacity. One commonly cited issue is that using stainless steel makes the vehicle heavier than it could be. And that's partly true. SpaceX chose stainless steel because it's cheap, easy to work with, and holds up well under the extreme heat of re-entry. That affordability matters when you're rapidly iterating and expecting to blow up a few prototypes along the way. However, switching back to carbon fiber is a potential alternative. While it's more expensive and complex to manufacture, carbon composites are both stronger and significantly lighter, an obvious advantage when every kilogram counts. Another promising route is improving the engines themselves. The upcoming Raptor 3 represents a major step forward in both thrust and efficiency. I'm really looking forward to seeing how much it can help address Starship's performance limitations, especially when it comes to increasing payload capacity. Now we get to the final question. What if Starship fails? Is there a possible plan B for SpaceX? To be clear, this is a hypothetical scenario. I believe Starship has a very good chance of working as planned, a fully reusable two-stage system. But let's imagine it doesn't. Suppose full and rapid reuse proves too punishing on payload capacity, or the vehicle can't be made robust and reliable enough for economic reusability. What could SpaceX do to build a vehicle that still comes close to achieving the program's goals? I think that's a worthwhile question to ask. First, let's assume SpaceX can reuse the Super Heavy booster, as they've already demonstrated promising progress here, but Starship itself turns out to be non-recoverable. Maybe no thermal protection system, TPS is reliable enough, the entry, descent, landing, EDL profile can't meet FAA safety requirements, or the flip and burn maneuver just can't be made consistent. If so, SpaceX would still have a very powerful and relatively affordable heavy lift system by continuing to recover the booster while treating Starship as expendable. In this scenario, Starship could be stripped of all recovery hardware, no heat shield, header tanks, flaps, or landing systems, thereby maximizing payload capacity. That version of Starship could still be used for launching Starlink satellites, sending up fuel tankers for orbital refueling, carrying third-party commercial or government payloads, supporting orbital propellant depots, and flying uncrewed lunar lander missions under NASA's Human Landing System program. Of course, this configuration would rule out all Mars return missions, and even moon surface missions would be off the table without some way to land the ship safely and reuse it. Still, it would be a step forward compared to existing launch systems, offering much higher payload and lower cost per kilogram to orbit.
Now, consider a different scenario where Starship can be recovered, but only with extensive and expensive refurbishment. This might happen if, for example, the ceramic TPS never performs reliably and SpaceX has to switch to an ablative heat shield. Even in this case, the system could still be viable. Launch costs would rise compared to the ideal, fully reusable model, but they'd still be lower than today's standards. SpaceX could continue to use Starship for satellite launches, cargo deliveries, and tanker missions. Lunar lander missions might remain viable as well, and even Mars exploration could be possible. In fact, even one-way cargo missions to Mars could be launched using expendable or semi-reusable Starships. For crewed Mars missions, if the landing Starship only needs to be used one more time to launch back into Mars orbit, it might still be sufficient. In that model, a return Starship could be sent ahead to low Mars orbit and wait for the crew who would reach orbit using their surface vehicle. It wouldn't support large-scale colonization, but it would be good enough for early exploratory missions. Another concern is the ability to land on unimproved terrain, especially on the Moon or Mars. If raptors consistently dig craters upon landing, or if dedicated landing thrusters are needed but not viable, Starship might be unable to safely land on soft or dusty surfaces. This could delay surface missions until infrastructure is developed, such as deployable robotic landing pads. It's a solvable issue, but one that could add years of development and support requirements, especially for Mars. Then there's the question of human rating. What if Starship can't be certified for launching or landing humans on Earth? That would be a serious blow to its utility for crewed missions. However, that limitation wouldn't be a complete showstopper. Crews could still be launched to low Earth orbit aboard Dragon capsules on Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, then transfer to a Starship waiting in orbit. It's not ideal, but it's a workable alternative for many mission profiles. In the end, even if Starship is never fully reusable, never certified for human launch or Earth reentry, and never capable of landing on alien terrain, it would still be one of the most capable and cost-effective launch systems ever built. Its sheer payload capacity and potential for booster reuse already place it well ahead of anything else currently available. But it's also clear that many of Elon Musk's most ambitious goals, like building a self-sustaining city on Mars, depend on achieving a high level of reusability, reliability, and performance. Without that, Starship might still revolutionize access to space, but not to the extent originally envisioned. Musk himself has often said that success with Starship is far from guaranteed. But SpaceX is taking an incredibly bold shot at solving this problem. And it really feels like they're getting closer to working through all the major challenges. What continues to amaze me is that SpaceX actually has the resources to sustain such an ambitious development program. The scale of investment, supporting a massive workforce, multiple factories, and several launch sites, is truly mind-blowing. Yes, they've had plenty of failures along the way, but with each one they learn something new. And because the vehicles are relatively inexpensive and built quickly, it makes sense to keep flying them as soon as they're ready. We, we, we could fail. Uh... I'm not saying we, we are certain of success here, uh, but, but we're going to try to do it.